in the roster. And uh, they were on last week, but I had it down for not last week. It's this week that they're not on. But we'll all survive. Um, you might be wondering why our series, God Humbles a, the Humbling of a Dictator, should I say God Humbles a Dictator, continues into Daniel 5. Because by this stage, Nebuchadnezzar has been dead for almost 25 years. You could say that chapter 5 is God humbling another dictator in a way that's very different to how he humbled Nebuchadnezzar. And because this is true, I almost call the series The Humbling of Dictators, plural. But the main reason why I'm going to chapter 5 in our Nebuchadnezzar story is that God is fulfilling the prophetic vision that um, we read about in chapter 2. So remember the, the, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had, and uh, because of the vision he had a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day, until it was explained to him. And, and what we have is the fulfillment of the first part of that prophetic vision that the Babylonian Empire, the head of gold, would be coming to an end. The kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar built is finished. The head of gold of the statue is no more. So chapter 5 is like a postscript on Nebuchadnezzar's story. And we will learn more about God as we consider it and we'll learn important lessons for each of us today. But before we go into these important lessons, let me try a little bit of a historical background, a, a quick survey. Nebuchadnezzar was, was ruler of Babylon for about 42 years. After his, he died, uh, the leadership of the country went into a period of uncertainty and political intrigue. Along the way, there were at least two, two assassinations. Belshazzar's father became king, but after a while he ends up going down to Arabia for some reason, and Belshazzar, his son, is made co-regent back in Babylon. And Belshazzar may have been favoured by the powers to be um, because he, he was in favour of promoting the traditional gods of the nation, which his father wasn't. It is very likely that Belshazzar was not a biological son of Nebuchadnezzar, nor a biological grandson. He might have been maybe more like a nephew, um, but history is not really that clear. Anyway, when the king says, and he's referred to in chapter 5, you know, as um, your father, Nebuchadnezzar, um, it could be just a polite cultural way of talking about the lineage of kings. But it might mean more than that. Um, his father could have married into the family in some way. So it's a little bit unclear, but maybe there's just a thing of respect. Your father, your father Nebuchadnezzar, the great king that came before you, that, that's sort of part of the background of what's going on. But this is a murky time in Babylonian's history, and the details are murky. Anyway, let's get into the story. And we're going to jump into the middle part of the story. And we're going to think about what we learn from history. And the reason for jumping into the middle part is that the middle part helps us understand the seriousness of what happens in the opening of the chapter that we had read to us. But I will read, before we hit the middle part, from verse 5. Um, suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale. And he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave away. The supernatural event terrified him so much that he wet himself. Well, it doesn't say that in the NIV and I think that's what Daniel wanted to say, but maybe he was too polite. And as the story transpires, no one can help him understand what is written on the wall. And then Queen Mother bustles in 
and she says, oh, there's this guy Daniel, whom your father, Nebuchadnezzar, made chief of all the wise men and magicians, etc. He is proven to be able to interpret supernatural things. Who are you going to call? Daniel. And Daniel comes in, and he's questioned by Belshazzar, and the way he's questioned, it appears like this guy knows nothing about Daniel. Doesn't even know what he looks like. It's like he's never seen him or heard of him whatsoever. And then Daniel launches into a a history lesson for this king. Picking up verse 18. I'll let you read the details more later. But picking up in verse 18, it says, O king, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the peoples and nations and men of every language dreaded and feared him. He's sort of highlighting that Nebuchadnezzar was a a, a next level king compared to him. And Daniel goes on, if you read, read through it, Daniel goes on to talk about how the great position he had, but also the pride that came into Nebuchadnezzar's life and how God humbled King Nebuchadnezzar by striking him with this mental disorder where he thought he was an ox until he turned his eyes up towards heaven and acknowledged that the Most High God is the only true living king of the universe. Verse 22 But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself. Nebuchadnezzar did, but you have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. And you have had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines drank from them, and you praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone which cannot see or hear or understand, but you did not honour God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. He already knew all these things. Up until now, we think, where was this guy? Daniel says, you know. You already know. I'm not telling you anything new. He was very likely a contemporary of Daniel in age. And he would have been in and around the royal courts and and, and the the social elite of Babylon all through that time, all through the time that Nebuchadnezzar went mad. And yet it seems that Nebuchadnezzar was clueless. How could this be? Well... All I can think of is he might have been one of these people that just lived life and was oblivious to things that happened around him. Relatively oblivious. Deliberately oblivious. They didn't matter to him. He didn't care to think about these big events that happened in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. He was the party boy with wine and women down at the the Las Vegas of Babylon. He gave no thought to how the true God of heaven acted to show his power, those kind of things were of no interest to him. So much so that Daniel was not even on his radar. You might know people like this. Some of you have told me that you're puzzled about you know, a brother or a sister who doesn't believe in the Lord Jesus They went to church when they were young, just like you did. They had the same family devotions, just like you did. And yet it seems like all that they heard was like water off a duck's back. It was as as if they were never there. Somebody can sit in church all their lives and kind of go through the same thing. When I first came out of college, um, the Presbyterian church was quite different in those days, And there were people in Presley churches who would say things like, quite openly, 
and I'm not sure if it was about me or someone else, this particular comment, but um, we will let him do what he has to do. What they were meaning was this in the context. Let him preach for 20 or 30 minutes. That's, that's what he's got to do, but we'll survive it by ignoring it. That was the meaning of we'll just let him do what he has to do. Some young people find it hard to listen to sermons. Maybe I'm boring to you. Maybe I could be better. But when you get to heaven and you act like you've not learnt anything, God's not going to sympathise with you that the preacher was boring. God, God's going to ask, well, did Don tell true things from my word? from the Bible. That's what he's going to ask. So don't be like Belshazzar. Don't tune out like Belshazzar, obviously tuned out. When we sit in church, we've got to make an effort to listen and to learn. Learn what God is doing in people around you, in our church community. Learn the God things in history, your history, our history, ancient history. Learn the God things. Take notice of them. Don't be like Belshazzar and tune out. Learn from history. Now let's go back a step to the start and let's think about don't mess with God. Don't mess with God. Picking up at verse 1, King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem so that the king and his nobles, his wives, his concubines, might drink from them. And they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles and wives and his concubines drank from them. And as they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. Nebuchadnezzar did this knowing all that he already knew about how God had acted with Nebuchadnezzar. This is Belshazzar's deliberate act of defiance. He knew that the God of Israel had humbled Nebuchadnezzar and made him think that he was a cow. He knew about the fiery furnace, or he should have known about the fiery furnace, Because a declaration was made after that event. Remember what um, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar said after um, the three men came out of the furnace. He said, therefore I decree. So if it's a decree, this was sent out. Everybody should have read this and heard this. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save this way. He would have known that. That was a decree. That was a message that went out. Don't say anything bad about their God or else. And here he is deliberately doing something to insult the God of Israel. I thumb my nose at the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. I'm not afraid of him. I put beer in his sacred vessels. Praise be to the gods of gold and silver and bronze. Definitely not wanting to praise the God that made all those things. In verse 5, suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand, 
In the royal palace, the king watched the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale. He was so frightened, his knees knocked together, and his legs gave away. He was so out of touch with the spiritual things and with supernatural things that he has an extreme reaction, like Nebuchadnezzar never had. When we were kids, we thought we knew what the meaning of this was. <laughs> meanie, meanie, tickle the parson. Now that I am a parson, I don't think that's funny. That's not funny at all. Fortunately, Daniel uh, understood the proper meaning of this um, passage, of the writing that's on the wall. This is the inscription, verse 25. This is the inscription. Meanie, meanie, tackle, parson. This is what these words mean. Many, God has numbered your days, the days of your reign, and brought it to an end. Tackle, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. God has numbered his days. God had weighed up everything and found him lacking and was going to remove him. The first lesson this morning was that the sin he committed was kind of ignorance, deliberate ignorance of ignoring the things of God. And often what happens next is clear defiance of God. At least this is the case for this king. He ignored and then he deliberately defied. In what ways have you seen some people defy God deliberately? Not just ignore him, but openly defy God. I wonder, I wonder what you have seen. You know, some people might say something like, if God is real, let him strike me with lightning today. Or, the world is in such a mess. If there is a God, he must be cruel or lazy. I won't have anything to do with that kind of a God. In the sexual revolution, which currently is kind of sweeping our culture at the moment, we are told that each one of us is the sole arbiter of defining ourselves. And political correctness means that God is not allowed to speak into this space unless he agrees with me. I know there's sensitive nuances involved in this topic in this issue, but it's not right to tell God to butt out. It is not right to say that God has nothing to say about these matters. Let's be very careful not to be in defiance towards God in anything. Let's not be in defiance. God will hold you and me to an account. That's a certainty. We'll come back to that in a minute. Let's move on. God does what he says. In um, verse 29, after Daniel explains the vision, uh, Belshazzar says, um, then Belshazzar commanded Daniel was clothed in, in, in purple and a gold chain placed around his neck and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. So even though he got really bad news, he still kept his word. And um, he made him the third highest. Uh, it's, not very, it's not particularly useful being promoted by a king who's not going to last very long. No wonder Daniel said to him at the start, oh, keep your gifts. But they're worth nothing. I know they're worth nothing before I tell you the meaning. And he was declared the third highest in the kingdom, and that's historically correct. He could not give him a higher position because his father was number one king. He was the co-regent, number two. 
So the best position he could give Daniel was number three. But there is not a hint of repentance in Belshazzar's response. Not even seemingly a hint of awareness of just what it all meant. Again, he seems to be Mr. Oblivious. Verse 30. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain that very night. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Things happen, just as God says. The writing on the wall, done. The first kingdom, the head of gold in the statue, done. God does what he says. Well, we can go on and on about what God does. Jesus was foretold in the prophecies of Isaiah about his incarnation, his his death and his resurrection, all those things were prophesied beforehand. Done. God does what he says. But let's make it more personal. Scripture is quite clear that our days are also numbered. Psalm 139, verse 16. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Our days are numbered. Secondly, your life and my life is already assessed and it is found wanting already. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And earlier in the chapter, it says there is not one righteous. When God looks on the earth, there's not one righteous. No one has ever been righteous. That means 100% perfect, except Jesus. So we're numbered, and we're found wanting. Earlier I showed the image of, you know, the uh, sort of the old-fashioned scales, um, you know, that weigh this and that over against each other. And, and, it, and that image can be a little bit misleading because people like to think of our, our good deeds and our bad deeds being put into scale and sort of God looks there and he weighs up to see if the good outweighs the bad or vice versa. But it's actually misleading to think that that's what Scripture is saying when our lives are going to be weighed up. So I have a different picture of scales for you to think about. And think about it this way, that, that when it comes to assessing your life and whether you ought to be allowed into his kingdom, he's not really interested in the good things that you've done. There's another angle that he is, but when he's just weighing this matter up, he's not interested. It's just a, it's a matter of will God find anything in your life? That is bad. So these scales measure badness. God's ultimate assessment is this. Is there even just one speck of sin in Don's life? Just one speck. Is there any evidence of gossip or uh, an unkind word or an unhealthy thought? Just to name some mediocre kind of things. And if the, anything shows up, just the smallest gram, I'm done for. I'm found wanted, wanting. It says in James chapter 2, verse 10, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. What it's saying is, unless you are 100% pure from the day you were born to the day you die, you will be found wanting on God's scales. 
And this automatically leads to another outcome. It says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. So if there's a microgram on the scales in your life, the reward, the wages, what you earn for that is death. The wages of sin is death. And that death means separation from God. The wages, the outcome of sin in your life means that you will be removed from the presence of God for eternity. God is a God who removes. Thankfully, that's serious, that's heavy, but thankfully there's more to Romans 6.23. Let me read the rest of it. For the wages of sin is death. But, but the gift of um, but the gift of God is eternal life in the Lord Jesus Christ. See that the wages of sin is death, and that's right and proper and true. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ Jesus our Lord. And we need to ask ourselves: Well, how do we get this gift? How do we get the gift that changes everything. And I want to point you back to Nebuchadnezzar and say, the story of Nebuchadnezzar has shown us how we get it. We humble ourselves before God. And for those of us who live on this side of the death and resurrection of Jesus, it means that we must humble ourselves before him and accept Jesus, incarnate Jesus, the one who died on the cross, the one who rose again and ascended into heaven, We accept him as our Lord and Saviour and trust in him completely. So, once that is done, once I have trusted in the Lord Jesus, his death and resurrection, well then, when God comes to assess my life and test my life, the life of Jesus is tested instead of mine. And when he tests the life of Jesus, he will not even find a nanospeck of sin. Because there isn't any. That's the beauty of the gospel. That's the good news. The good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus. I am saved from myself by what Jesus has done in my place for me. Belshazzar held a smash-up party. thinking that the enemy is outside the city, and they would have been there, thinking that the enemy is outside the city, could no way come into the impregnable fortress of Babylon. Again, he was in denial. The danger was at hand. His was a party of fools, and it ended in disaster. Jesus speaks of a banquet, a great banquet. All who put their trust in him will one day be gathered together in a great and wonderful banquet. Not a blasphemous banquet, but a rejoicing banquet. And as we're already told in the vision in Daniel Daniel 2, the kingdom of Jesus is a kingdom that shall never end. The blasphemous kingdom stop quickly, but the kingdom of Jesus never ends. And remember, God does what he says. The bottom line for you and me out of this today is don't ignore the true and living God like Belshazzar did. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who reveals yourself in the actions of history as well as direct messages. And there's so much we can learn. There's so much you want us to learn, even from events that happened thousands of years ago, because you are God and you never change, and you speak to us through all your actions. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that we would be clear that we are not like Belshazzar, but that we have humbled our hearts before you and we believe in the Lord Jesus, our Saviour, and that we know 
that we cannot ignore you because you do what you say. We pray this in our Saviour's name, Jesus. Amen. Uh, thankfully, Jesus has um, our saving work at hand and we can sing about that in this song, Yet Not I, But Christ in Me. So let's stand and sing this beautiful song together.